Okay, uh, my name is Bruce Yates, and I enlisted in Sheridan, Wyoming. I currently live in Dayton, Wyoming, which is very near Sheridan. <laughs> but um, I enlisted in the Army, and I served, uh, well, I, after basic training in AIT, I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division in Vietnam. Um, and then when I came back from there, I served a year and a half in Germany. Um, in Vietnam, I entered the country in Cameron Bay and was there long enough to catch a flight to An Khe, where uh, the headquarters for the 1st Cav Division was. And I was only there for maybe three days or so, went through um, some repelling training <laughs> and uh, and then was assigned to C Company of the 8th Engineering Battalion uh, which was a C Company was a support unit uh, that was that were used for uh, uh, some of what we were doing was uh, landing zones and our uh, uh, demolition and chainsaws basically <laughs> with the engineers and I was in that unit for a while uh, and I was even in their motor pool at, at uh, LZ Hammond I think was the name of it and then we moved north to LZ English which was at Bong Song and that's where I remained uh, stationed the rest of the time in Vietnam and uh, um, I, I was, uh, while I was still at Hammond, um, I, it was interesting that in our, my basic training units, I was about the only one, I was only one of two that had college education, and most of them just didn't have uh, much uh, education at all in those units in that combat engineering at Fort Leonard, Missouri and um, so that's how I got assigned to that type of a unit and when I was in LZ Hammond um, I was visiting with the company commander there and he he said you have quite a bit of college I want to see if I can get you in the headquarters company because they're short of of uh, staff there for surveying and so on. And so I did a road design for him in a sandbag hooch during the monsoon when <laughs> I, my, uh, I forgot to tell you that I was there f from December 1966 through December 1967. And, uh, and so shortly after that I was reassigned to the headquarters company of the 8th Engineering Battalion and uh, in that unit um, I did surveying and other engineering type work um, and throughout the rest of the year uh, I spent time uh, we built a bridge that was about 80 feet long capable of handling uh, M60 tanks and artillery units in the I'm not sure where it was even at I think it was along the Cambodian border somewhere but uh, I, I kept getting reassigned to different types of projects and uh, um, there were several airstrips that uh, combat uh, mission type airstrips like for C-7A caribou uh, we had to build them in the field, design them in the field, and, <clears throat> and build them. The unit I was in had, it was air mobile. All of our equipment was air, was air mobile. And uh, it was small, so it, it was uh, difficult to build big sites like that. But we, w I remember building one site that was north of, of uh, Bong Song, between there and Da Nang that was a uh, C-7A caribou airstrip. Uh, it was built strictly for a combat mission that was going on uh, just right next door to us. And 
and uh, we built it in the field in five days. There were, um, I think it was five uh, soldiers that were killed on that job, and uh, uh, that was the only. Uh, we got we got <laughs> sky beaver citations for that. Um, uh, in a couple occasions, I spent uh, with some of the infantry units out in the jungle, <laughs> looking for uh, complexes, tunnel complexes, and things, but. Uh, we had a dozer with us, uh, and we'd just wander around and, and dig up uh, tunnel complexes. And I, I was there to try to map them and do measurements on them and things like that. But um, outside of that, uh, I did some work on building um, base camps for some units that were coming to Vietnam. and. One was an armored unit, so it took a pretty big area, and uh, and that we were building a perimeter road and ran into a minefield. And uh, another job that we had was clearing some of the mines on the highways for the convoys that were coming through there, and uh, probably one of the most memorable memorable <laughs> times was when our uh, ammunition um, storage unit went up in flames in, in, uh, at LZ English, which is probably the largest ammunition storage facility in North Vietnam, in the northern part of South Vietnam, I mean. And uh, it exploded for three days and had us pinned down and uh, I mean, it was probably 100 yards from it. But we had just finished building berms up the side of this, where all this ammunition was stored. I mean, these were rockets and, uh, you know, the helicopter uh, things. And there was uh, a large helicopter unit there. They got most of the aircraft in the air, but there were several of them that got destroyed, including a field hospital that was destroyed. And it, it uh, we, we were kind of pinned down uh, for th about three days with explosions, things like that. But the villages around there were damaged pretty bad. And that was a enemy that got into the into the ammo storage and, and set it off. Oh, uh, I don't know. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> um, I guess personally, and I, you can't really answer for all veterans, but. Personally, how do you feel about this state-sponsored event that they put on? And how do you feel the populace, you know, the veterans as a whole, are feeling about this event so far, sir? This, this event? Yes, yeah. Sir. Well, it's the first time since I've been, was in Vietnam, that, that we had anything. When, when I first came back from Vietnam, it was a, a, a time when I didn't wear my uniform because I got tired of the, the things that were going on, and I went. I was went back to university for one, one, two semesters, and finished my degree. and And at the university, of Wyoming, I I didn't tell people I was in the military. <laughs> that was a year and a half after Vietnam, uh, but it was in 1969. It was still going on, you know, then. But because I had gone to Germany for a year and a half, and that was pretty pleasant. I was in engine, an engineering unit there, and, and uh, my last few months of time in Germany was in, was shooting on a competitive pistol team. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I liked the army, the military. It was. Um, and it was it was nice to get away from the university for a while, but when I came back, I was ready for <laughs> school, and I really enjoyed it. But I stayed pretty quiet about being in the military. There were some vet there were some military people going to school at that time in an engineering college, and and I visited with them. So, do you have a question? I don't. No? I just want to thank you very much for your service.
Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm uh, glad that I was in the military. I thought Vietnam was, uh, it was a, it was a good service. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people over there. Uh, of course, the war part of it was not fun, but, but it was quite an experience in the military, and, and I enjoyed it. Bruce, can you tell us a little more about <clears throat> your, your time at UW? Were there, what, what is it exactly that made you feel uncomfortable about wanting to wear the uniform? What, what was going on there? Well, the, the, it, University of Wyoming wasn't near as bad as some of the other schools, but uh, just uh, there was a lot of students that were against Vietnam and some protests were they weren't real big protest groups, but um, in traveling before I got out of the service, I learned that that you had to be careful where you went in a uniform. Even um, I tried to fly everywhere, but I wore a uniform because the fare was half half fare at that time for for veteran or for soldiers that were flying, and so I wore my uniform and. In some of the places, Denver was bad. It, you know that the protesters would would circle around you and and call you names and spit at you and things. And we didn't dare do anything in retaliation. That the military warned us not to. And and uh, it was even worse when I returned from Germany because it, the war was really the protesting was. I didn't see a lot of that. The, the military didn't show us a lot of it, uh, on the uh, or in the news that we were able to get. We knew it was going on, but we didn't know how bad it was, and until we would travel to to get home or something. Did it surprise you? Yes, I, sometimes. Uh, most of the time, I was expecting it, so I did. I. Uh, did things to, to avoid it, <laughs> but uh, at the university, I never had a problem. But there were protests and things going on, and um, I didn't have any uh, instructors. But I was that were a, a, against Vietnam that or that that let me know they were against it so I you know because I was mostly taking engineering classes some of my <laughs> instructors were veterans and and uh, so it, they went pretty well there there were other parts of the school that were worse than, than in engineering but, but, uh, and then since that time after college I got into the consulting engineering for 24 years and um, at the tail end of my career, before I retired, I was county engineer and public works director for Sheridan County, and and I managed a lake also, <laughs> Lake DeSmet. Um, but that's been my my career basically. Do you have any health problems that you would relate to your Vietnam experience? None that I really know for sure. I think there are some things, but I don't know. I, I've avoided the, the VA because I feel there's so many more people that are in need of service. I've just never felt comfortable going to the VA. I have never asked them, other than for the GI Bill for two semesters, um, I haven't tried to get VA services at all. Um, the the war the, what's going on now is just such a tremendous drain on the VA system that I'm not comfortable in even asking them asking for help. But I don't have any serious problems. Yeah. I was fortunate in Vietnam to to not have any injuries or or knowing I don't. I never had to be medevac anywhere or anything. Um, I saw a lot of that, but uh, it wasn't me. <laughs> I visited with the 
fellow that was talking at noon about his a thousand plus missions on a medevac chopper and I I thought my goodness how how could you do that <laughs> uh, so anyhow I, I feel pretty fortunate to to have pretty much gotten through it without any <laughs> problems um, uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, I was wondering if you wanted to tell you a little, uh, briefly, the story of the friend you made over, over there. You can <laughs> oh, talk to Adrian. Yeah, I, when I was stationed at LZ English, we were building a new road around a part of the perimeter of the, of the facility, and there was a group of little kids that would come by every day, and, and, uh, Sometimes they'd take our, our, and do our laundry and things like that. And uh, there was this one little girl that was about eight or ten years old that just wanted to know about the United States. She would ask me questions about uh, Mount Rushmore or New York City or places I didn't know much about. But, but and we, of course, neither one of us could speak the language, but... She was able to get across what what she w was interested in. We we visited several times, and uh, she brought me a school book that she uh, that she gave me. It was a I I could tell it was a biology book, but of course I couldn't read any of it. Her tremendous uh, handwriting, and and uh, it was a kind of a neat little book and she wanted me to take it. It was a book from her previous year and she went to a Catholic school. It was interesting. Those kids that you could see out like that where we were working, you couldn't talk to them when they were in their school clothing. The girls wore a long ankle length silk uh, dress to school and uh, they were prohibited from talking to GIs, um, but when they were out like that, it was okay. And I, I ended up adding a, a schoolroom on their school, which was probably, oh, five kilometers away from where we were, but uh, we we built a room on the school for them and, and while well, she was at that school. So I, I just kind of got acquainted with her, and, and she wanted to learn about the United States and, and what it was all about and how we lived. And this is a very rural, they didn't, the people there lived in grass huts and, and uh, didn't have electricity in most cases. Um, how, they, how they cleaned their clothing and things, I don't know. It was amazing to me because they were snow white, the, especially the, the girls in their school dresses were just absolutely perfectly clean <laughs> and yet they were living in rice paddies basically um, mm, that was, that's really interesting in our construction we had um, a large we had the twin rotor I, I, I lost some of the names but the twin rotor helicopters and the Sarkarsk, Sikorsky cranes that would haul our equipment out to a site. And uh, um, <clears throat> that was interesting working around, around those. Most of the construction workers would not carry M16s <clears throat> because there was so much sand and dust, you just, you, you couldn't even get the slide back on them. So they carried uh, M14s, which were gas operated, and, and the, the equipment operators would do that. At the end of the day, we we would clean our uh, weapons because you couldn't even open them, working around those helicopters all the time. And so, uh, but it was it was kind of interesting with the equipment we had. We had to uh, like a dozer. We'd have to split and take the tracks and the blade on one load and the tractor on the other load and things like that. Uh, but we'd, we'd 
<clears throat> get on a job site and put it back together and, and start working. And I was, I had to do m most of the design work on the jobs, right? If you went out and gathered information in the field ahead of time, then the whole area would be mi a mi minefield when you started working. And uh, at night we would just uh, move all our equipment into one area and, and build berms and that was our perimeter. <laughs> and then the next day we'd have to clear the mines from the job site. But that was fairly easy because you could see where they dug the hole. <laughs> and um, on Highway 1, um, which went from Cameron Bay all the way to Den Da Nang, we had a certain section of that that we had to clear every morning and uh, it was pretty tough to see some of those because there's potholes everywhere anyhow and uh, so once in a while a truck would hit one of them but uh, they were nothing like the, the uh, mines that, that are uh, in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. <laughs> They're lots, much more powerful. In fact, most of the mines that we ran across in Vietnam were American-made mines. <laughs> um, the Chinese mines generally didn't explode. <laughs> How did that feel, I guess, um, running across American-made mines? Did that, um... Well, we didn't think too much of it because uh, they captured some of it and some of it was acquired probably through the black market, I don't know, but uh, it, it actually to those of us that were clearing the mines, it felt good because we knew how to disarm an American-made <laughs> mine, but uh, the Chinese mines were, you had to figure out what to do. But, so it really didn't, didn't bother us too much. <laughs> it's just part of Part of war, I guess, we, you, you see things that came from your own <laughs> uh, munitions. That there was so many different, I mean, the, the people in Vietnam uh, are so innovative when it comes to building things. Uh, some of our ammunition boxes that uh, the artillery came in, you they would take those and build beautiful furniture out of them, you know. And it, it's a, it was amazing to Such me. What? Pardon? What type of furniture? What would you see? Oh, uh, um, well, like cabinets or uh, um, um, dish cabinets or, or things like that. that Turned that, out from crates. Yeah. Well, an ammunition box that say a 105 millimeter artillery round they're nailed together with uh, blunt nails they're all made nailed with machine driven nails and it's extremely hard to get them apart without breaking the wood but they managed to do that and <laughs> uh, and build things with it of course they build things that we didn't want them to build too i'm sure <laughs> There was a lot of uh, that type of lumber. They didn't have much in the way of building materials uh, in that area. Um, just about everything they did was uh, with grass huts and things like that. The little kids were amazing to me. They could do things that you wouldn't expect them to do, like climb a coconut tree and get a coconut down for, you know, a, a coin <laughs> or something like that. And um, they might only be four years old. <laughs> but they just, the little kids were so independent. They could survive on their own, I think. Uh, and I, I enjoyed dealing with them because they were, they were happy and cheerful. And <laughs> Would you ever entertain the idea of going back? Oh, I'd love to, but it's expensive. And uh, um, 
there's a lot of walking and I'm not very good at that. <laughs> but if yeah. you could, you'd enjoy I probably it. would, yeah. Yeah. It's the, uh, from talking to some of the people that have gone back over there, the, the Vietnamese people that are still there are so friendly, even though uh, it, it's it's a communist country now, but uh, but they're friendly, and I'd want to go into the area and see what how much it's changed, you know. <laughs> I worked with a lot of different types of units. Uh, I was with a Green Beret unit at one time for oh, a week or two, building an, an air um, landing zone place for helicopters. And they had a group of Monte Guard uh, soldiers with them. They were a whole uh, Family. I mean, they were all fam they were, they were very fam family oriented, and and uh, those those soldiers, those people were very dependable and trustworthy. Uh, where some of the South Vietnamese units weren't that trustworthy. Mm -hmm.